Genius literally means the spirit that enters a world when a person is born. And so from before we were born, there's a seed of self that tries to grow and become known by us. And then the difficulties in life, the losses, the traumas, the accidents can be seen from a certain point of view as the intensity needed to crack the seed, to reveal the self, which has the medicine and the sense of purpose and the capacity for guidance. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dr. Espen podcast. I am your host, Espen, and today I'm joined by Michael Mead, a renowned storyteller, author, and scholar of mythology, anthropology, and psychology. I'm sure you've uh, heard of uh, Michael before, and if you haven't, stay tuned. This is going to be a short, sharp, but very powerful com uh, conversation. Uh, Michael combines the hypnotic storytelling, uh, street savvy uh, per, uh, perceptiveness and the spellbinding interpretations of ancient myths with a deep knowledge of cross cultural rituals. He's the author of the Awakening the Soul, the Genius Myth, Fate and Destiny, Why the World Doesn't End, The Water of Life, and so on and so forth. Michael Mead is the founder of the Mosaic Multicultural Foundation, a non profit network of artists, activists, and community builders that encourages great understanding between diverse peoples. Today, we're going to talk about how to find our individual genius, um, correct collective and individual rites of passage, and of course, also our purpose and our calling. I want to say a very special thank you, Michael. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you. Good to be here. Perfect. Okay, let's get straight into the first question. I want to ask you, Michael, please, um, when it comes to individual genius, how does one tap into and or find their inner genius? Well, it's, it's complicated, as they say nowadays, par partially because each soul is unique. And the genius is the spirit inside each person's soul. And so that's kind of unique as well. And so because the spirit of a person is unique, the finding of the spirit tends to be unique also. In other words, there's no clear plan. There's no specific steps. So you have a person who can be like a prodigy and their genius manifests at four years old or six years old and everyone can see it. That can happen. And then that person, in a sense, knows about their genius before they're able to understand what they know. And then you have other people who don't seem to not find it. So usually what I find is that the genius of a person will manifest in adolescence, somewhere between 10 and 13 years of age, in some fashion. Uh, and then it goes latent and it's dormant in the psyche. And then it tends to wake up um, later in youth. And often the uh, waking up of the genius is a dramatic event that is not necessarily positive, or at least is not necessarily seen as positive by a person's family and their teachers and so on, or it can be positive. So there's all these different ways that it can happen. And I'll say one other thing to make it really complicated is the genius of a person is connected to their inner wounds. And so sometimes if you're like mentoring or working with young people, the way to get to the genius is to go through the wound. When you're working with where a person is uh, wounded early in life, you're actually close to their genius. So I'm not sure if that I just helped or made that more complicated. Genius is the spirit Mm -hmm. of a person's life that uh, awakens in its wholeness. It kind of awakens as a whole thing, like what happens with a prodigy. So, it, And then when it awakens, it can be experienced as a troubling thing or as a revelatory thing. Awesome. That makes a lot of sense. You know, I always say to my students in the pit is where the purpose is revealed in the trauma is where the transformation begins. What are your thoughts then on rites of passage? It seems that in the past, rites of passage were in many cultures an active thing where people, you know, young men and women would go through this experience as a 
you know, uh, it was it was tailored. And now it seems that a lot of that has been forgotten in society. What are your thoughts on rites, rites of passage in regards to, you know, potentially finding ourselves and our genius? So rites of passage are what's called an archetypal thing. It's archetypal. It's endemic to the human soul. It's um, um, motherhood is archetypal. Fatherhood is archetypal. The child is an archetypal condition. Uh, youth is an archetypal condition, and so is rites of passage. So archetypes tend to rise and fall in terms of how uh, they're present in human societies. Uh, I mean, like in, in the modern world, materialism and economics are archetypal things that are really high in the interest level of people and in the, in the institutions of people. But in ancient times, it would be something more like rites of passage that would be in the elevated place. And the idea of rites of passage was that um, natural growth takes a person from the one cell, the original one cell, to the end of childhood. A person naturally grows. At the end of childhood, the next step of growth is not natural. It's actually a leap. It's a leap of faith into a different orientation of the self. And I think when people realize that ancient people, they developed rituals, often called rites of passage, in order to help someone make it from the end of life into the middle of what their life is supposed to be. And so we have lost that rite of passage. And that means that the majority of modern people don't know the center of their own life. And I'm sad to say the majority of people who become leaders in culture have not been through a transition that leads them to understand who they are in essence. And that way you can get leaders who are brutal and lack sympathy because they don't even have sympathy for their own deep self. So rites of passage typically would be the way that the young person awakens to their connection to nature, their connection to the cosmos, their connection to spirituality, um, and also through which the culture reforms itself. In other words, in the process of bringing the next group of youth into uh, an awakening condition, the culture has to awaken to some degree itself again. And so we, lo we lose both the awakening of the individual psyche and the opportunity to further awaken the collective group or the society. Would you say that is happening now, now Michael, in terms of a, a global awakening of humanity? I'd love your, your thoughts on this because it seems that there's a lot of chaos in the world and many of us tend to believe that this is part of the purification and the rebirth and or the healing. What are your thoughts on the matter? I often say we're in the middle of a rite of passage happening on a collective level um, that humanity is trying to awaken to a further, deeper understanding and further step in how to be humane. Um, and the middle step of a rite of passage, the first step is departure, separation from all that was before. And the second step is sometimes called ordeal but the best name for it is liminal. It's the space between one thing and another. It's the space where one thing is being let go like childhood and the other thing, which is an awakened sense of self, is only beginning to appear. So if you move that onto a collective level, you could say the way, the way that we saw the world, for instance, the Western worldview, is falling away. It's actually already gone. And we have found ourselves in the uncertain, sometimes chaotic, sometimes terrifying liminal space that happens for the next phase of the world uh, to be born. And so rites of passage, which used to be prominent in all cultures at one time and then disappeared more or less from attention, now I think is back. But rather than starting at the beginning, it's like we're starting in the middle. Institutions are collapsing, uh, understandings are failing, wars are intensifying, and some people would say that's the end of the world, but in mythology you would say that's the beginning of the next world. So the end and the beginning happen at the same time. The end is more pronounced and more evident. The beginning is hidden just the way the growth of a person is hidden inside their own soul. 
Wow, I love that analogy. Okay, so it's a collective process and an individual process as well. With that in mind, how do we prepare, Michael? I know you've been in this game for a very long time. You have a very kind heart. You have a very sharp mind. You have some messages that really, really have benefited the world in so many different ways. What would you say would be some great advice for the people out there, our listeners and viewers that might be thinking, okay, I get it. This world is changing. I'm changing with it. I know love is the answer and, and I'm willing to, to be a part of this. What would, be, what would be some steps or some things to keep an eye on moving forward as the world potentially goes into chaos? Who knows? So first thing I think of is mythological, which is to say that um, uh, life is transformation. Transformation is the essence of the cosmos. Stars and planets are born and dying all the time. The same thing is happening at the level of insects. And so I've spent a lot of time recently studying the metamorphosis of butterflies because they're fragile and delicate and they're a symptomatic of what's happening in climate crisis. Uh, and, and yet the old Greek word for butterfly was psyche. So that tells you that our psyches are like butterflies, that our psyches are capable of metamorphizing. Um, and then when you get to the psychological level, it seems to me really important for people to know, and I keep trying to remind myself, we all have a deeper self within, which is centered and grounded and has its own knowledge and it has its own medicine. And rites of passage would have been the way we experienced that intentionally when we were younger. But nowadays, you you can find it by just trying to uh, meditate inside oneself or take any experience of healing, and you'll find part of what healing, part of what makes healing possible is the awake, awakening of the deep self. So that's the first thing, I think, is understanding in the big picture, the world is always transforming, so is nature, so is the human psyche. We can make it through this. The next thing is the realizing the little self, the ego, has a uh, a deeper uh, self that really knows what we're here for, that the deep self knows our psychic style, but also our aim and our purpose. And when the world is falling apart, people, here's a strange thing, when the world is rattling, the calling becomes more emphatic. And calling can get through more easily because the structures that block things are more per impervious or more, more permeable is what I mean. So there's that. And then maybe one more thing is that um, in the liminal stage, in the middle stage between the end of one thing and the beginning of the other, one of the important things is to be able to accept not knowing. Um, it's the ego that wants to pretend it knows all the time. And when real change is happening, the ego has to depart. In rites of passage, the elders would would... Uh, take over and a person would let go. The ego would disappear from the situation so the deep self could appear and the person could feel safe and supported by the presence of knowing elders. We haven't had that experience, but that experience is also archetypal. So I think we can trust that the deep self knows what to do uh, and that a uh, part of our practice has to be not knowing. In other words, the only way to learn something is to stand at the end of what we know. And right now, we don't know what the next world will look like. And in order to get glimpses, we have to enter a state of not knowing. Then what can happen is beginner's mind, for instance. Mm. And with that not knowing comes, of course, trust, acceptance, surrender, stillness, these principles that we can kind of anchor ourselves into knowing that we're guided and protected along the way. Yeah, and I'm assuming that there's outside guidance if a person can find a teacher or a practice, or, or if they dream deeply, or if they happen to have visions. Uh, but there's also guidance from within. And, and I find that really reassuring. The sense that the, the way Native Americans would say it is, the soul of each person has the medicine that that person needs. What we're looking for is not out there in the world simply, it's actually inside. Um, the process of growing on a psychological and spiritual level has always been the process of waking up to who we already are at our core. 
So that's what genius means. Genius literally means the spirit that enters a world when a person is born. And so from before we were born, there's a seed of self that tries to grow and become known by us. And then the difficulties in life, the losses, the traumas, the accidents can be seen from a certain point of view as the, um, the intensity needed to crack the seed to reveal the self, which has the medicine and the sense of purpose and and the capacity for guidance. Oh, this is the kind of podcast where I'll be going back and listening over and over again and taking notes. I hope you guys are doing the same. There's a lot in here. Um, you mentioned the indigenous elders of the uh, you know Na- Native America and so on. I've had the privilege of sitting uh, in a lot of ceremony with uh, particular medicines from that lineage, be it that plant medicines and and other things. And what I've learned a lot is not just the plant medicine in itself, but the sacred ways, the teachings of the songs and the honoring of the elements and the honoring of the breath and the honoring of great spirit and 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 that which is within us that is love. Um, What are your thoughts on ceremony and ritual in terms of um, this process that we're experiencing as a a humanity? So I love the idea um, that I heard from Native people, uh, that ritual made me. I love that phrase. If a person is in a meaningful ritual, um, it isn't that they become a different self, it's that they are more deeply made into the self they already are. And, and, and so the old term was that ritual made me. It made me wake up. It made me realize who I was at my core. It made me find my footing on the path of my life, that kind of thing. And people have always used ritual to do that. And, um, I'll go, go back to rites of passage because there are many kinds of rites of passage and initiation, but the initial move inside the archetypal uh, dynamic is the move of youth into not necessarily adult, but into a full, more full life that can be adult-like. And one of the old ideas was that in a rite of passage, the young person, whoever they might be, is moving from the lap of their mother to the lap of mother nature. In other words, we were supposed to have an experience at the time when we were liminal anyway. All young people are liminal. liminal. They're all betwixt and between. We were supposed to have an experience at that time that can, gave us a connection to nature. Native Americans would call it the waking of the second soul. And the second soul is the soul connected to nature. But in traditional cultures, that second move, that awakening, would also be awakening to a connection to the entire cosmos. And so modern people, uh, the cosmo- cosmology of the modern world is that it's a big accident. Um, and that seems to mean then if a person is born, they're accidental. But all the traditional cultures said that a person is born as a specific being coming here to find and hopefully live a meaningful, specific, you could say, unique life. Ritual was the way that a person would keep finding the unique elements of their own soul, the way a person would find healing. But healing means to make whole. So every act of healing is a deeper connection to the deep self and soul. Mm. Well, that feels absolutely congruent. And I've realized that within my own um, making of, you know, creating my life to be more um, sacred. I found that I find parts of myself come through in my rituals and my practice and my stillness, etc. I know you're very big on talking about souls entering, um, you know, coming into the human reality, having this experience. I want to ask you, um, because in, in some regards, it seems like there is almost like a war going on between the darkness and the light. Um, what are your thoughts on, um, are there forces out there that are trying to stop the evolution of humanity or the awakening of humanity or, or the, uh, the, the experience of enlightenment? Uh, what, is, what is going on in, in, in your mind with collectively, I should say? So... There are lots of ideas that have been more or less captured by um, uh, creed-based religions that, that I think it make it hard to really think. The oldest definition of evil I've been ever, ever been able to find means unripe. 
the evil thing has not ripened into knowledge. So just, you know, to consider that way rather than caught, be caught in a binary. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, along with the not knowing and the liminal space, we are in a descent into darkness. Um, creation myths, I've studied creation myths from all about the earth, and they all start in eternal darkness, the eternal ocean, the time before the light came and the sky and the earth were separated. So that tells me that when we enter a time of darkness, we're not further from creation, we're actually closer to it. Mm. So the the world is constantly recreating itself, just the way nature, the forest, uh, the big trees fall down and they rot, and from their collapsing into the earth come the next forest of trees. Our cells do the same thing. Transformation is the essence of creativity and is the essence of the human soul. But transformation means going into the dark to find the light. So rather than the polarization of light and dark, I like the old idea that the light that we're looking for is found in the darkness and that these these times of betwixt and between are also a time of descent, like the COVID crisis took everybody into a descent. Um, And I think it was symbolic of what's happening on a psychological level. And so... I like all the old poets who say, you know, let the dark see, let the dark times season you. Or the old definition of the human soul is the light hidden within darkness. And so I think we're going through dark times. I think it's fairly evident and I don't think that they're not going to end soon. So we might as well allow ourselves to be seasoned and then try to hold on to the idea that the what light we're looking for is hidden in ourselves and hidden in the essence of nature. Oh, I love this. And 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 I am um, I I was teaching on this the other day. I was saying our ability to respond now will come in alignment to our ability to handle uncertainty. And you mentioned this not knowing before. I think this is so pertinent. I mean, how could we know? We could have an idea, an intuitive understanding, or perhaps or something greater, but you don't really know exactly what will unfold in what way. So I love this notion of recognizing that the darkness is not the opposite of light. Well, I, there's the old saying, I think, is, is coming through for me now. You know, the darkness is not the opposite of light, it's the absence of light. And now seeing it through what you've explained, going through the dark within us, within our experience of life, is the bringing forth of the light. That is just the perfect redefinition instead of this, as you mentioned, this uh, binary twofold dichotomy as in once better or worse. This is very lovely. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I want to ask you also, if we're now, we're experiencing reality and we're experiencing, I believe it, at least many of the people that are watching and listening this that are, you know, are following our work and, and perhaps even yours, and certainly they should be. I believe that in this instance, a lot of people have begun work, work, waking up. They know that they are that which is consciousness, that which is aware, that which is love, that which is light, they're aware that they're having a, call it a temporary human experience, and they're going through this experience to the best of their ability to live a magnificent life and care for others, um, and maybe even, you know, achieve something or or grow in a way, as you mentioned. What would you say are some of the most important things to focus on now if we are to say, I do realize that this is a collective process of you know, ascension or evolution, what would be some of the things that each individual could focus on a daily basis to make sure that we can, one, do it for ourselves, our loved ones and our families, and maybe even actually partake in the evolution of humanity at this time? A number of things come to mind. One is a saying from William Blake, the uh, artist, philosopher, and poet, who said, every day has a moment of eternity waiting for you. And to me, what that means is the eternal light, the divine would be the shortcut. The divine is waiting for us to find it every day. And in contrast to the way uh, many of us were taught in the Western world, uh, eternity is not heaven that we wait till after we die to go visit. Eternity is hidden in this world. Eternity is in, in, I've worked a lot with people in West Africa. And they say nature is spirit with a green garment on. 
so that uh, what we consider nature as separate from culture, they consider nature as spirit deeply connected to our own inner light or spirit. So um, I think we have the opportunity to learn more about human nature, more about how human naked nature is connected to great nature, more about how the whole thing is an ongoing song of creation. And then um, I think in terms, my own experience is in terms of how to stay in contact with things that are meaningful, uh, the things that are full of love, beauty, and light, um, when the world is rattling and, and full of polarization and conflicts, is to have a practice some kind of practice. And the two great roads of practice are meditation or contemplation, where a person goes quietly inside to find the center, the grounding, the light, or creative arts, where a person acts from the inside out, bringing light from within out and adding literally to the creation of the world by creation, creating things that weren't there before. And so I think that one of the few ways to find uh, consistency and stability in a rapidly changing world that turns up upside down a lot is to have a meaningful practice and do that every day. Some people are more pulled into the meditative road. Other people are more pulled into the creative path. But most people actually do both. Oh, I love this. So what I love to do is to reflect upon wisdom teachings such as this for our listeners and viewers. And by that, I would say with what Michael just shared, what was the takeaway there for you? Was it the meditation, contemplation? Uh, was it the creative expression? Uh, and or is it a combination of both? And how can you create that ritual, that ceremony within your life to ensure that this maintains um, you know, a part of your practice moving forward? I really feel like this is this is so critical indeed. And I actually gave a lecture on this yesterday. I talked on spiritual fulfillment and I brought up both of those two, both the, the meditation and the stillness and also how to be creative as in no multitasking, just allow your uniqueness to be expressed uh, onto whatever canvas that you choose to, to paint, metaphorically speaking. Um, so we find ourselves here now, um, we find ourselves in playing a meaningful role um, in you know, humanity's evolution, what would be some advice that you would give, you know, say to your younger self or even to young individuals out there that might not have had the realization of who they are just yet? Well, I've done a lot of work with young people, particularly young people severely at risk. And the first thing I learned, um, especially working with suicidal youth and, and very violent youth, was to say, listen, you know you have natural genius. And I pick that word because it's a Western word, it's a Latin word, uh, and most people think they know what genius means. But most young people haven't been told that wh what they're looking for is inside them. In the Western world, young, young people are taught you have to make something of yourself. And the first thing I say to young people is you already are something. The problem is that something you are has been traumatized or canceled or not uh, recognized by other people. And so then we have to recognize our own genius, our own calling. So then maybe that's the next thing that I think is really important. Um, uh, I learned early on that you could have a calling in life because I, I happen to have that experience. And then I figured out that everybody has a calling. It's just that we have been educated away from hearing it. Um, and, and often a person's calling is in contrast to their family. And so then a person can be young and living in the family and experience a calling and have the family say, well, we don't go that way. We don't like that. So, um, so a person, a young person has to have a sense that they are already something meaningful inside themselves. They need confirmation and blessing for that to be true. In other words, we cannot convince ourselves completely. We need some kind of outer person that we might respect to say, I see your beauty. I see your genius. I see your giftedness. Um, and then the next thing is to somehow connect that to a calling because the calling is calling to the genius already there. And once the calling becomes more clear, then automatically the person has a connection to meaning and purpose in life. 
The calling is a calling onto a path that can lead to a greater awakening of the unique qualities of the individual soul and a connection to the deeper self. And then in that lineup of things, the outcome is that every person is here to give their natural gifts to the world. And just to make the loop back to where we were starting from, no change in the human soul, no change in the world. That's the old saying. It's not that a group of people would get together and figure out the right thing to do. It's that many, many people will awaken to their genius nature, awaken to their natural calling, awaken to their capacity for love, as you've been saying, awakening to the deep light of their self, and then acting from that place in ways that are alignment with their own inner, inner nature. Enough people begin to do things in the world that without even coordinating with each other begins to change the world. That's the old understanding of how it hap happens. So I try to say to e each young person, you're here with this unique opportunity that will never occur to anyone else because you are unique to contribute, not just to the awakening uh, and fulfillment of your own spiritual life, but also to be an agent contributing to the ongoing creation of the world. Oof. Oof. I think this is a perfect time to talk about the Living Myth podcast. So Michael Mead has a podcast. It's the the weekly Living Myth podcast. If you felt what I felt, which was truth bumps, moments of of awe in this conversation, Living Myth podcast, go and check it out. And I want to before we uh, before I ask you the final question, please, Michael. I want you to tell us, if you could, a little bit about Mosaic Voices. And I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it correctly with my bit of a Norwegian twang, but tell us why you chose that name and what it really is in terms of the work that you do. It wasn't astute in terms of digital uh, branding, but uh, uh, what I was doing was going Mosaic uh, means the, uh, to me, one of the old meanings of it is to bring the broken pieces back together and make something new. And so that was the, the what I started out with when I, when I was first beginning to work with people of different ethnic and racial backgrounds, trying to work together and work through all the problems that we've mm -hmm. inherited. And I wound up thinking of it as a mosaic where we are the broken parts and we try to use the, our, our broken parts to create the next vision and the next way of being. And then voices um, came from working with young people. Uh, a person needs to find their voice. And I don't mean like on the uh, TV program, uh, the voice or something. Um, everyone has an inner voice. Everyone has a natural poetic expression in their own soul. And when a person finds their voice, they are able to express what's really within them. And if you go back through creation myths, in most creation myths, they don't say in the beginning was the word. They say in the beginning was the sound. And each thing that comes into creation is resonating and vibrating in a unique way. And that means that each person is resonating and vibrating in a unique way. And the inner vibration of a soul of a person can be expressed uniquely through their voice. And that means not just their speaking, because voice can mean their making they're loving the it, voice becomes the expression of the uniqueness of the soul. Oh, I so love mosaic this. voices. Yes. <laughs> I thank you for explaining that because I had a feeling that it was something of that nature and there's mosaicvoices.org, everybody mosaicvoices.org. And as we just talked about as well, um, if you like listening to wisdom, like I, uh, love, I'm, I'm, I'm an auditory learner, uh, living myth podcast, go and look it up. I've got one last question for you. So if I may, surely. All right. It goes like this. I want you to imagine uh, now, Mr. Michael Mead, you were on the world stage and every, every sentient being alive is tuning in, listening to your message to the world. Whenever you're ready, feel free to take your time, take a breath if you need and tell us, please, Michael, what is your message to the world right now? One message would be that old stories say that humans were created because there was something missing in the world after everything else had been created. And those original makers deciphered that what was missing was twofold. One thing that was missing 
was a consciousness that could recognize the beauty and the hidden wholeness of creation. And the second thing that was missing was a gratitude for the gift of life. And so in these dark times when everything seems to be falling apart, in these times when all the energy seems polarized against each other, part of our job of being genuine human beings is to keep recognizing and finding the beauty that is the world and the wonder that is creation. And then in doing that, and I know this can be difficult if a person is suffering loss and pain and trauma, but in addition to that, the role of humanity is to find ways to be thankful for the gift of life. And then I would repeat what I said before, each life is a unique gift being given to the world. And if we can imagine ourselves as uniquely gifted and here to do something and contribute something meaningful, um, and if we can make a practice out of that, which just means finding one's voice and being oneself, then we are secretly contributing in the way that is best for us to the world. Thank you so much for sharing your unique gift with us so that we, the listeners and the viewers out there, can actually uh, find theirs and find their own light and, and engage in those rituals. Um, thank you so much for your time, Michael Mead. I really appreciate it. So again, it's uh, mosaicvoices.org. Um, as I mentioned, the podcast, Living Myth Podcast. Uh, and of course, you can find Michael on, on YouTube and, and on uh, other platforms as well. Um, thank you for taking the time to share this with us. For those listeners and viewers out there, if you've enjoyed this, check out the podcast and, and the stuff that we talked about. And please do share this with as many people as you can. Michael Mead, thank you so much for your time, sir. Great being with you, Espen. Thank you. All blessings. All blessings. Michael Mead, everybody. Thanks so much.